How vast the night is. How bright and wonderful. I've never seen it like this. They say there's a star for each of us. I used to imagine that when I was born, God put a dark star in the sky. A star nobody could ever see, not even me. And then one night I'd see a flash of light. And I'd see my star, but it would be falling, and I'd be gone. It was dark because I, I didn't really exist at all. I was a dream, and I was the one who was dreaming it, too. There was a memory of being a child in a country like this. And they told me that I was Queen of Scotland. It didn't mean as much to me as my dolls. And then I was very important. Not to myself, but to grown-up people. And then, then one day I caught a glimpse of my star. And they took me away at night on a ship. It was all so strange that the sea vast like this. The world seemed enormous. And then we came to another land and they told me it was France. Everything different, people singing, laughing. <laughs> they were all happier. I learned to love it all. After a while I began to think that I'd, I'd only dream Scotland. But I'd go on forever playing in a garden, learning French, studying, hearing music. I would marry the son of the King of France when I grew up. That seemed silly. He was just a boy. We used to fight, and then I'd chase him, and he'd run away. I was 16. It was just an arrangement. And then one day his father was killed in a tournament. And everyone made a great fuss over me. And I was Queen of France. But before I could realize it all, he died too, poor boy. And then I was Queen no longer. And then I came back to my old dream, to Scotland. Madam, if your head had matched your heart, I would be the one awaiting death. This video is dedicated to the remaining points I wanted to look into with Mary Queen of Scots, but didn't have time to put into the other videos. This is a pretty big question to ask given how English, Scottish and later British politics were affected by the reigns of both Elizabeth and Mary. Was their rivalry inevitable or necessary? Or could there have been a way for the two queens to live peacefully with one another? Or was it because Elizabeth and Mary had different outlooks on the world around them that set their destinies in stone. Elizabeth grew up constantly reminded of who she was and had to take scrutiny with quiet grace until English politics had nowhere else to turn but to her. I have known fear. When a child I was dismissed. I was female. I was Protestant. And I was a ginge. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mary had been a queen all her life and was convinced divine right was enough to state her dominance. In my view, there was only one thing that really doomed Mary which Elizabeth never had to worry about. Having an heir. But I'll expand on that later. First, I'm going to finish up what I couldn't in the rankings video. Immediately following the execution, whether it's the end of the film, or the midpoint, or the start of Act 3, the impact of Mary's death changes depending on which queen is meant to be the protagonist. Either Mary is the ultimate victor because she has a son, who will succeed Elizabeth, or Elizabeth triumphs against the great wave of Catholic animosity that came after her following Mary's execution. This is a storyline typically followed when Mary is the main character, although the film may, verbally or by ending text cards, explain that while Elizabeth was a great monarch in her own right, she would be the end of the Tudor dynasty, and James VI of Scotland, Mary's son, succeeded her. Thereby, Mary ultimately wins over Elizabeth, because it is her blood that unites England and Scotland into Great Britain. Then again, James was still a staunch Protestant. He was raised with Protestants to be Protestant and continue subjugating Catholicism, resulting in the gunpowder plot. And Catholics in Britain would continue to be treated as second-class citizens until the 19th century. 
And of course, let us not forget that in less than 50 years of the Stuarts being in control, Mary's grandson was toppled by Parliament and had his head cut off. They were lucky that Richard Cromwell was so unpopular that it led to a conditional restoration of the monarchy, but the rest of the Stuart monarchs would not see a successful, long-lasting legacy afterwards. So, how much did Mary truly win in the end? Granted, we're looking at all of that through the benefit of hindsight, and know how things played out for the monarchy after Mary and Elizabeth died, and we realised how unlucky the name Charles was for kings. Meanwhile, Mary herself, and all subsequent incarnations on screen, were sitting around in Fotheringay, awaiting death, and taking some comfort that at least her son would be able to succeed Elizabeth. As for her faith, she went to her death, certain that it would spark a huge religious war against Britain, and bring Catholicism back with righteous vengeance. She couldn't have predicted that the Spanish Armada would fail. When it comes to Mary being the ultimate victor, this usually results in Elizabeth and Mary actually meeting, which they didn't in real life, although every time such a scene appears there is usually an explanation as to why people wouldn't know about it. This usually shows a resplendent but desperate Elizabeth urging Mary to save herself because Elizabeth does not want Mary's blood on her hands, especially since Elizabeth knows that she got to the throne via the smallest of loopholes and fears this one act will spell disaster for her. Mary, by contrast, despite her fall from grace, can come off as the more noble queen because she faces what is to come without fear, while Elizabeth will continue looking over her shoulder until her death. Is it better to live a life in fear? or have a greater cause worth dying for, even if you won't know the outcome. There is, however, a price to all of this. And while it is okay to portray Elizabeth as somewhat fearful under her Gloriana facade, Mary's triumph almost always appears to be paralleled with Elizabeth's loneliness. In other words, because she died unmarried and childless, she had no one to follow her. But ultimately, I viewed this as depicting Elizabeth as inherently lesser because she never had a child. Maybe she wanted to, but she was far too traumatised to let anyone in. Now when Elizabeth is the protagonist, she is usually shown spending vast amounts of screen time mulling over what to do with Mary, even before the Babington plot. When it ultimately comes to sentencing her cousin to death, even if that includes a fictional meeting scene between the two queens, it is then shown that Elizabeth takes advantage of a situation to make it work in her favour. Even in Rain they did this, which was very surprising. Mary wasn't really a martyr in that version, more someone who has lost everything and is ready to face what comes next. Meanwhile, Elizabeth calls out the destruction Mary has caused to James and suggests that the ultimate unification of Scotland and England was meant to be achieved by someone else. She convinces James to sacrifice his mother for the English throne, for long-term gain. Elizabeth is too uncertain of the consequences if she does kill Mary, because it will bring a war that she doesn't think she can win. Meanwhile, her advisers think it's more dangerous to keep Mary alive and let her continue to be a beacon to Catholic plotters. In Elizabeth I, she manages to find a loophole, while she signed the warrant but gave the orders not to hand it to the council. But if the warrant just happened to end up in front of the council and they acted on it anyway, she still had deniability. This was ever her way. Sideways, sideways, sideways. And when it comes to the Spanish Armada, Elizabeth was very, very lucky. The English ships were faster in the water than the Spanish, and were more adept at firing on enemy fleets from a distance, while the Spanish preferred to fight up close. The only problem with that was the wind wasn't in their favour and they couldn't get close enough to the English shore. Don't listen to the Golden Age, they barely got anything right. There were other attempts, but Philip's naval forces were repeatedly destroyed, bankrupting Spain, and Elizabeth used this luck to her advantage to prove it was Britannia who ruled the waves. The main disadvantage to it, however, is much like with the previous one, where Mary is underdeveloped to lessen sympathy towards her. Sometimes, she doesn't seem natural. Elizabeth R seems to find the way around this, however, where Mary was somewhat humanised, and her frustration at being imprisoned and watched for so long, and only speaking with someone who she did not trust or consider her equal, was understandable, but her general demeanour made her someone you wouldn't want to stay in the same room as for long. Elizabeth may regret killing her for political reasons, but there were very few in England who would have truly mourned her. So however you present these two queens, unless you have a long form of cover for both of them, one will always come off more favourable than the other, and either this can come off as a heavy-handed betrayal of two women helpless to the whims of the patriarchy, or it's a sexist dance of one or the other, black and white, 
no complexity. A middle ground can be reached, it just requires being able to look at the conflict from both sides and seeing the bigger picture. Mary is one of those queens who has had one of the most diverse range of appearances. When I study these queens, I have thus far only had Anne Boleyn have a consistent appearance that matches her contemporary physical descriptions. Mary Queen of Scots is a queen who had many portraits. Her last known that was created in her lifetime was by Nicholas Hilliard in 1578. In each of Mary's portraits, she is shown with red hair, which is typically associated with Scots, but also a lot of the Tudors and their relatives had red hair, even though a lot of them aren't portrayed with red hair in their on-screen depictions. Mary appears to have inherited hers from her mother, who was shown with red hair in her marriage portrait with King James V, who appears to have been blonde. Mary was considered a beauty in her time. This was something that not even John Knox could deny, as he described her as pleasing. Mary was also described as somewhat tall for a lady, but she had likely also inherited that from Marie de Guise, who was also described to be quite tall. The height difference between her and Francois II was very noticeable, although in their joint portrait in Catherine de Medici's Book of Hours, they are shown as the same height, with Francois in front of Mary. Her appearance in it is almost identical to her portrait by Francois Coulet, where she is shown in a pink gown, contrasting the blue backdrop. It is high neck for modesty, but also decorated in pearls and gold trimmings to show her noble and virtuous status as both queen and dauphine. She's seen removing a ring from her right ring finger, no doubt planning to place it on the opposite hand. The next known portrait of Mary was also by Francois Coulet, where now, as a widow, she is wearing a black dress, a white bonnet and a veil, which completely covers her upper body. She has no jewellery on, but her garb would still have been made from rich fabrics. Her final portrait, it's very similar to the previous piece, although Mary is bedecked in much more complicated lace, with a large ruff and trimmed bonnet, along with a crucifix pinned to the front of her dress. By this time, Mary may have already started wearing a red wig to hide her greying hair. It is very similar to something Elizabeth might have worn, but still keeps to the norms of mourning wear. Elizabeth may not have approved of the portrait if it showed Mary in too favourable a light, but it compromises by showing that, while Mary may have been a prisoner and deny the opulent fashions that Elizabeth would have worn and was often displayed in her portraits, Mary was still a highborn lady who, even in captivity, continued to express herself through her wardrobe and may have even made some of this ensemble herself. It is this portrait that most resembles Mary's effigy in Westminster Abbey. The majority of Mary's on-screen counterparts give Mary her historical red hair, albeit in various shades, from dark red to light ginger. The decision to have both Mary and Elizabeth as redheads helps demonstrate that these two queens are two sides of the same coin, as well as hinting towards a familial bond. I don't have anything against a dark-haired or blonde Mary. It depends which actress you cast, and whether their skin tone can suit either dyeing their hair red or putting a wig on. Adelaide Kane, for example, has a very distinctive complexion where only her natural hair colour would look authentic in a period piece. A blonde Mary gives a visual contrast to Elizabeth, especially in scenes where Mary dresses more humbly than her cousin, but that's all the symbolism you can get out of it. Honestly, it does work better if they look similar, but are in fact very different under the surface. This is a huge hot take. But I have watched everything about Mary Queen of Scots and done a lot of research, so I think I'm qualified to say it. The biggest mistake Mary could have made was having someone who could easily replace her. Someone the Protestant nobles could mould into their way of thinking without stubbornness. Someone who was a legitimate Stuart directly descended from the previous line of kings. This is one of the main reasons why I believe Elizabeth was wiser to keep stringing her advisers along when they kept thinking she might marry someone and then changed her mind at the last minute. When Mary returned from France in 1561, she did not marry Darnley for another four years. In that time, with no immediate replacement available, Mary ruled somewhat unimpeded. I mean, she still had John Knox to deal with, but it wasn't until she married Lord Darnley that things began to go downhill for her. Darnley may have had the right family connections, but his character dragged Mary down with him. His demand for the crown matrimonial, his jealousy towards David Rizzio, and his drunkenness made him the perfect target for the Protestant lords to use as their puppet. 
Even after having a son, Donny was too dangerous to be left alive, and he was assassinated in the most obvious method possible. Mary's involvement in her husband's murder is unclear. It may have been a Thomas Beckett situation where she verbally stated a wish to get rid of Darnley and someone carried it out without consulting her. Bothwell is typically considered to be the culprit and had long-term plans to claim Mary for himself and may have believed in the strength of his own army to resist any of the backlash. There is a possibility that the Protestant lords either framed Mary and Bothwell or subtly manipulated the latter into killing Darnley and later used the casket letters to further discredit their queen. The casket letters are another thing I haven't touched on yet, but their authenticity has been questioned too many times. Whoever did kill Darnley was either thinking in the long term or a huge idiot. So now Mary's husband is dead. She has married someone else not long after and her reputation is in tatters. The idea that she might have killed her husband has tainted her image. Though she may have once had Catholic support, Bothwell was a Protestant divorced man. In the eyes of Scottish Catholics, it is an unlawful marriage. If Mary had no heir at this time, there is a slim chance that she could have held onto her throne and worked through it to gain control once again. However, the nobles opposed to her realised that they could in fact start again. Mary had left her son at Stirling Castle and hadn't thought to keep him close while she faced her opponents. Mary, to put it bluntly, had made herself replaceable. Elizabeth did not. Any monarch considered doing a bad job could easily be replaced by the next in line. Hence, they were made figureheads in rebellions, which Elizabeth experienced firsthand during her sister's reign. When she became queen, she kept a strict eye on possible contenders, including Mary and the remaining Grey sisters. She would never confirm the identity of the next in line, or even have an heir apparent, believing that if anyone for a moment thought she was replaceable, she would be in danger. Even if she declared James as her successor after killing Mary, this may have led to an uprising, attempting to avenge Mary and put James on the throne, rather than allow a peaceful transfer of power. Now that is not to say that a queen couldn't be a queen if she had an heir. Isabella of Castile managed to rule successfully without being deposed, but she did have a stronger foundation to stand on. She and King Ferdinand were key to the union of Spain, being consorts of each other's kingdoms as well as being a ruler in their own right. The two of them respected each other enough to share power and rule together. Unfortunately for Mary Queen of Scots, she did not have the same luck. Both Bothwell and Darnley saw her as a means to gain more power for themselves. To Elizabeth, having a direct heir just wasn't worth the risk, and it was more beneficial for her to prove herself as a successful and competent ruler whom her advisers had to protect because they didn't have any other options. Mary, on the other hand, didn't appear to have the same awareness of how fragile a ruler's hold on their throne was. She didn't appear to understand, especially in Scotland, that just being a ruler didn't mean that they had all the power. Just saying, I am the queen, did not automatically make a subject drop all disobedience and bow to her. Just because she was born into power, it didn't mean she didn't have to earn it. I am the king. I will punish you. Any man who must say I am the king is no true king. I don't know when we're going to get another Mary Queen of Scots. She may return in the second season of The Serpent Queen, but that show alone is not much to write home about. Tudor dramas tend to come in waves, and we're currently on a retreat from this most recent one. Firebrand and the second series of Wolf Hall are the only upcoming dramas that we're getting in the near future. I'm still waiting for my Catherine Howard movie directed by Sofia Coppola, but I think within the next five to ten years, we will get another Mary, either as a main character or in an upcoming Elizabeth drama. It's a classic role for an actress to play. I would like said drama to A, make doubly sure that Mary doesn't have a Scottish accent, and B, understand that Mary was in a tough situation, but didn't make the best job of it. But it wasn't all her fault. She was born into a violent world. Wars were fought because of her, and she had no control over that. She was raised in a foreign kingdom and returned an outsider. What's more, she had to face an influential Protestant leader who was disgusted at the idea of religious tolerance, which Mary wanted to promote. In my honest opinion, John Knox was stubborn and hateful and used his faith to justify it. And yet Mary did not seem to plan far ahead in order to determine her success. 
She appeared only to make decisions which would keep her alive for the moment, and relied mostly on her royal status. Presenting a character as flawed as Mary is difficult because they can sometimes come off as unlikable. But Mary and the actresses playing her often get by on charisma and charm to show she wasn't completely hopeless, just dealt one bad hand after another. Above all, Mary has to be played by a competent actress. If we can't like her, we can't care about her. If we can't care about her, we are numb to her downfall. A bad performance will deal her a deadlier killing blow than the axe that actually killed the real Mary. Mary's story doesn't have a black and white narrative. Only people who did what they thought was the right thing, over or underestimated their chances, and reaped what they sowed. The religious element cannot be ignored, and a clumsily handled drama can come off as an intolerant view of one virtually identical denomination of Christianity over the other. I do like it when we see the contrast between the two queens, but you don't have to favour one or the other. The only advantage the 2018 movie had was showing that the two of them were quite similar, even if Elizabeth was almost nothing like her true self in that film. If Elizabeth had been a little less savvy, she could have easily been in her cousin's place. Basically, I want a drama that understands the world Mary was born into. Have her be played by someone competent and not be up your own arse about pumpkin breeches. Now we're done with Mary Queen of Scots, I've covered all but two of the queens from the Tudor era, but seeing as those other two are strictly subscriber specials, when I next do a screen queen, we will be going out of bounds into different countries and time periods. I want to cover Catherine de' Medici next, which will finish up my coverage of 16th century queens with numerous on-screen depictions for now. Catherine will be a single video project, as I want to cover more this year and do more stuff like literary hot takes and specials. Seeing as another Mary drama is almost inevitable, I don't feel as though I'm saying goodbye to her in this video, so much as parting ways with the expectation of seeing her again soon. And that wraps up Mary Queen of Scots. Granted, we still have the final Rain review to go, which will hopefully be out by the end of June. So next, of course, as I said, Catherine de' Medici in a single video. But also, since we finished with Richard III, the next subject, as chosen by my patrons, will be Elizabeth Woodville. So another screen queen for the playlist. That will also be a single video. And once I've done Elizabeth Woodville, I'll do another Patreon poll, and that will be another literary hot takes. The subjects of which will be decided later. I want to do more literary hot takes, basically. And if you want to be able to vote in any future polls, make sure that you sign up to become a patron. Because being a patron really does help this channel, as well as being a subscriber and a regular viewer. There are different advantages you can get from being a patron, including getting your name in the credits in every single video. And I must give a shout out to my top tier patrons, my King and Queen patrons. Thank you, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill My Nero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. And if you can't afford to become a patron, that's fine. You can always subscribe, make sure you like the video and leave a comment because that really does help in the algorithm. I really would like a nice boost in the algorithm. I'll see you next time.